Good day, grade 12. Welcome to this next lesson on physical science. Um, I would again like to urge you to join our classes so that you can message me and tell me the sections that you're struggling on. At the moment, I'm going through momentum and impulse, and that is quite a tricky section for a lot of my students, so I hope that you will learn from this. If you find that you are um, missing something in the lessons or if you cannot make these lessons because of the time slot, then feel free to come and click on the same point at the link and you can watch a recording of the lesson. Okay, so let's get started. Now we spoke about Newton's law, no sorry, we spoke about momentum and what we said was that momentum is equal to mass times velocity, that's all that we really did, we went P is equal to MV, we also spoke about the change in momentum delta P which equals M delta V, that's what we spoke about, okay. Now we need to talk about Newton's second law of motion in terms of momentum. Now, I know you guys don't believe me, and it's the weirdest thing ever, but just as much as there are different fashions in um, clothing wear, or in hairstyles, or in cell phones, um, there are fashions when it comes to, or trends when it comes to asking questions in science, and one of the positive trends at the moment, one of the fashionable things as I like to call it in science at the moment is asking about Newton's second law in terms of momentum. So please make sure you understand the section. So first of all, Newton's second law of motion states, when a net force acts on an object, the object will accelerate in the direction of the force at an acceleration that is directly proportional to the force and inversely proportional to the mass of the object. Okay, so we summarize that by writing F net is equal to mass times acceleration. Okay, but now Newton's second law in terms of momentum states, the net force acting on the object is equal to the rate of change of momentum. Now you have to be careful, grade 12. If they ask you to state Newton's second law of motion, you have to state this. If they ask you to state Newton's second law in terms of momentum, you have to write this. If you write the wrong one, you don't get the marks. You have to get it right. So what does it say? It says the net force acting on an object is equal to the rate of change of momentum. So what is it saying? It's saying that F res, the net force, resultant force, is equal to the rate of change of momentum. Whenever you see a rate of change, all that we're doing is taking that thing and dividing it by time. When you see rate, we're dividing by time. So we're going, F res is equal to delta P over delta T, but we know that delta P is equal to M delta V, which can be rewritten as M, Vf minus Vi, right? So that's where that comes from, over delta T. Now, it's quite a jump to get there, so I'm going to explain how, to do, how you'd get it. Equations of motion time. If you have an equation of motion that says Vf is equal to Vi plus A delta T, and that is on your formula sheet. Do you agree we can solve for A? We could say Vf minus Vi is equal to A delta T. Therefore, A is equal to Vf minus Vi over delta T. A is equal to Vf minus Vi all over, A, all over delta T. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that I've substituted for Vf minus Vi over delta T and I've substituted in A. So in other words, we've just proven that the Newton's second law of motion is equal to Newton's second law in terms of momentum. So both these equations exist and they both work. Okay, so now let's look at an example. We've got a 200 kilogram motorbike and it moves from 18 meters per second to 23 meters per second in five seconds. It says find the resultant force applied by the motorbike. Okay, now because we are in our momentum section, we're obviously going to use momentum equations for this. Okay, so we know that F net is equal to delta P over delta T. 
which is equal to M VF minus VI all over delta T, right? Do we have the final velocity? Oh, sorry. Do we have the mass? Yes, we do. The mass is 200 kilograms. Do we have the final velocity, VF? Yes, we do. It's 23. Do we have the initial velocity? Yes, we do. It's 18. Do you have the change in time? Yes, we do. It's five seconds. And I know that this is a vector and I know that we need to worry about directions, but do you see that the motorbike is traveling all in the same direction at the time? It's going from 18 meters per second to 23 meters per second all in one go, right? So if that's the case, we don't actually have to allocate a direction. We can just assume that the direction it travels in is positive because it's traveling in the same direction the whole time. Right, so now we can substitute this into an equation and then we can get out our calculator. So let's do that now. So we have got F net is equal to the mass, which is 200. Final velocity is 23 minus 18 all over 5. Okay, I don't even know if we need our calculators. So we've got 200. 23 minus 18 is 5, all over 5, those cancel, which is 200 watt. It is 200 newtons, and the force is a vector, so we always have to give it a direction. And since it is positive, and we said that the velocities were positive, it has to be in the same direction as the velocity, so therefore it has to be forwards. There we go. Okay, let's do another example. A bullet of mass 25 grams, it's quite a big bullet, strikes a target at 315 meters per second and exit at 275. So if this was, for example, which it isn't because this is a much smaller bullet than that, but if it was a bullet of 25, it would be coming into the apple at 315 meters per second and it exits the apple at 275 meters per second and the tip of the bullet takes 0.001 seconds to pass through the target and it says determine the magnitude of the force experienced by the bullet. Okay, so again we know that F net is equal to delta P over delta T, right? And delta P is equal to mass Final velocity minus initial velocity all over again, change in time. So again, do we have the mass? Yes. Do we have the velocity? Final velocity? Yes. Do we have the initial velocity? Yes. Do we have the change in time? Yes. What's wrong with this mass? What's wrong with this mass is that is in grams and it has to be in the kilograms for it to be in the SI unit. So to convert from grams to kilograms, we need to divide by a thousand because there are a thousand grams in the kilogram. So that becomes naught comma naught two five kilograms. Okay, and that's very important because your kilograms is your SI unit. Otherwise, you're not going to get newtons out. You're going to get something that's not newtons. Okay, so now we can substitute these values into this equation. So the mass is going to be 0, 0, 0.025. Again, the bullet is traveling in the same direction. So I'm going to assume that both of these, are, well, I'm not going to assume, I'm going to allocate that this direction here is positive. So they are both traveling in the positive direction. So therefore the final velocity is going to be 275, sorry, minus 315 all over the time which is 0, 0, 0, 1. Now unfortunately this one is slightly trickier than the last one. So I'm going to actually have to get out my calculator. So let's get it out and clear it. So we're going to go 0, 0, 0, 0.025 open brackets 275 minus 315 
close bracket all over naught comma naught naught one equals minus a thousand. So that's minus one thousand newtons. So it says determine the magnitude of the force experienced by the bullet. And that makes sense. The bullet has slowed down. So therefore the force has to be in the opposite direction to the motion. So you could either leave it like that as minus a thousand newtons, but they've asked you for the magnitude, so you could just write the answer, which is a thousand newtons. If they asked you to determine the force experienced by the bullet without the word magnitude, you would have to write 1000 newtons backwards. Okay, because obviously it's been slowed down. Now let's talk about systems. We can't really go on with momentum and lesson questions in momentum unless we understand what systems are. So let's talk a little bit about systems. What is a system in physics? A system is a physical configuration of particles or objects that we study. Okay, everything outside the system is called environment or surroundings. In other words, if we say that a system is basically makes up everything that we're considering, okay, and everything outside the system we consider to be the environment or the surroundings. Now, there's a different thing between open systems and closed systems. A closed system is one in which the temperature, volume, pressure, and other variables are kept constant and are not affected by the environment or external forces outside the system. An open system, for example, this one, these values can change and probably do not remain constant for long. And why? Because it's, because it's open, it allows for evaporation to occur, which is going to affect the temperature, it's going to affect the volume, because obviously as the liquid evaporates, the volume is going to decrease, and it's going to affect the pressure because again the smaller the volume and the lower the temperature the smaller the pressure so closed system variables remain constant open system you are basically getting outside influences so a closed system is also called an isolated system okay and that's important it's an isolated system so yeah are the three definitions that you can use to explain an isolated system. Either you can say the total amount of energy in the system does not change, okay? So in other words, the energy before any a reaction or something has to equal the energy after. Or you can say there's no external, external, please note, net force on the objects in the system. Or you can say the objects in the system are isolated from external forces. So why is this important? The reason that this is important is because we're going to consider concepts in physics where we're going to say that it's in an isolated or closed system. And the reason we need to do that is because in real life there are so many forces acting on objects all the time that we would never be able to model it perfectly. So what we do is we say, okay, fine, let's assume that it's in a closed system and then model it according to the biggest forces that act on it. So our answers are not 100% correct, but they're approximately, they're almost there, they're 99.99% correct for our purposes, okay? So basically we're cutting out some forces that we can't cope with because there are too many. So let's look at an example of a stalled car. If the car is just sitting there and it's not going anywhere, do you agree that it's got nothing acting on it? But if it's stalled, there's this dude that is pushing it, okay? Now, if this dude, if for example, you, this dude was sitting inside the car, right? And he's sitting inside the car and he thinks he really needs to get the car to go forward. So what he'll do is he'll try and push on the accelerator harder, but the car stalled. There's no power to it and everything else. Is he going to be able to push the car? No, he is part of the system. He's inside the car. He's part of the system. He cannot actually participate. He cannot push the car. But if he gets out of the car and pushes it from outside the car, now he is producing a net external force. So he is 
causing there to be an acceleration if he gets it to move, okay? And here's an external force. So now he is outside the system and the system is no longer closed. It is now open because it is allowing him as an external force to act on it, okay? So let's have another look at another type of example and that would be collision between cars. Now, if the collision occurs between two cars on the road with lots of friction, then the collision is not isolated because the friction is participating in the collision. It's going to have caused there to be a loss of energy from the system. But if there's no friction, then the system is considered to be isolated, okay? There can be external forces, but if they are balanced, like the two cars and each other, then by Newton's three, we can say that there's no net force and the system is considered to be isolated. So for example, when we have this collision, if the car A, the yellow car is acting on the blue car, but the blue car is also acting on the yellow car, then those external forces balance each other out. And therefore we can say that effectively the system is considered to be isolated. Now we need to talk about the principle of conservation of momentum because it is dependent on a closed isolated system. So it states that the linear momentum of a closed isolated system remains constant. Okay. What that means is that if you have a collision or an explosion, the total momentum before a collision is going to equal the total momentum after the collision. Okay, the total momentum before has to equal total momentum after. And the only way to really understand this is to do some examples. So what we have here are two billiard balls. Okay, we've got the little white ball and the little black ball. And they both have a mass of 150 grams. So the little white ball is traveling towards the little black ball at a velocity of two meters per second. And the little black ball is traveling towards the white ball at 1.5 meters per second. So they're coming towards each other, they're traveling towards each other, right? After the collision, this is before a collision, after the collision, after. The little white ball is traveling at 1.5 meters per second still in this direction. And we want to know what's going on with the little black ball. Okay, so now the law of conservation of momentum states that momentum before a collision equals momentum after the collision. Now, we're assuming that these are an isolated system because we're not taking into account the friction, the force of friction played by the, the felt on the, on the billiard ball table, on the billiard table with the balls, okay? We're assuming that there's no force of friction, okay? Um, I know that if there's no force of friction, the balls won't roll, they'll just slide, but that's beside the point. We're assuming that basically the forces of friction are going to cancel each other out because the objects are the same mass and da 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 da, okay? So we're saying that they are in an isolated system that's just these two balls that are interacting, and therefore we can say that the momentum before has to equal the momentum after. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that the momentum of the white ball, I'm going to call it W for white, plus the momentum of the black ball or the eight ball, I'm just going to write B, has to equal the momentum of the white ball plus the momentum of the black ball afterwards. Okay, happy with that. Because the total momentum in that system before has to equal the total momentum afterwards. Okay, so if that's the case, this is the mass of the white ball, the initial velocity of the white ball, plus the mass of the black ball, the initial velocity of the black ball, has to equal the mass of the white ball and the final velocity of the white ball, plus the mass white ball, of the black ball, the final velocity of the black ball. Now, that line there, has to be written when you are writing uh, these sums for the conservation of linear momentum. This line is given a mark, it's allocated a mark, okay? Well, you might think, well, it's one mark, whoop. But 
if you incorrectly substitute values in and you don't write this line down, then you cannot get method marks. The nice thing about science is that you can get method marks. So if you write down just numbers and you incorrectly substitute numbers in because you just didn't realize or put a minus where a plus was supposed to be or something silly. Okay, if you incorrectly substitute the numbers in, and you haven't shown them what you're substituting into. You can't get any of the marks from the rest of the sum, like as in method marks, okay? But if you put this down and then you substitute in incorrectly, they can see where you did that and then they can allow for it and then you end up with a whole bunch of method marks. So this is very important. Okay, so now let us work through it, shall we? So we've got the mass of the white ball. Now all the balls have the same mass. So we don't really have to bother with it, but I'm gonna show you anyway. So, the answer, this should not be in grams, it should be in kilograms. So 0, 0,15 kilograms is the mass of all the balls, okay? So we've got 0, 0,15. Now, velocity is a vector. So you need to choose a direction as positive. And generally, I choose the first one I come across as being positive. It's just who I am, what I do. So this is positive which means that this direction is going to be negative, okay? So therefore, this is going to be 2 plus 0, 0,15 times by minus 1, 5 is equal to the mass of the white ball, which is 0, 0,15 times the final velocity. And notice that the final velocity is in the same direction as the initial velocity. So it's also positive. So it's going to be 1, 5 plus the mass of the black ball times its final velocity. Okay, and we're trying to find out that. And the reason I didn't bother to fill this in is do you see that this mass is 0, 0,15? That's 0, 0,15. That's 0, 0,15. That would be 0, 0,15. So I could actually take out a common factor of 0, 0,15 and then cancel. So those go away. So what am I left with? I'm left with 2 minus 1, 5 is equal to 1, 5 plus VFB. Okay. So therefore, we've got 2 minus 1, 5 is 0, 5 is, oh, sorry, minus 1, 5 is equal to VFB, because I'm just taking this across, okay? So therefore, we end up with minus 1 meter per second is equal to the final velocity of the white ball. So this is negative. So it actually ends up going in this direction here, and it ends up going at minus one meter per second. I just want to check my numbers. That's two minus 1.5, 1.5, yeah, and no, I'm right. Okay, there we go. Okay, not too bad. Hey, let's do another example. Now, this example is different because this is an explosion. So what that means that instead of the objects banging against each other, bouncing into each other, and then um, bouncing off again, what has happened is they are stuck together initially, okay, and their initial velocity is going to be zero, and then they explode, they push off from each other, so that this is going in the left-hand direction and that's going in the right-hand direction. Right, and let us see what we can do, okay? So, let's say that I want to try, okay, so do you agree that before, the initial velocity before is going to be zero? Why? Because if I did this, I'd have to write P before, is equal to P after, right? P before equals P after. Now, do you agree that the P before is zero because it would be the mass plus 2m, okay, the mass plus 2m times by the initial velocity, okay, is equal to the mass of m, right, times by the final velocity of m, 
plus the mass of 2m times by the final velocity of 2m. I'm calling this dude M and that being 2M. Okay, do you understand that? And these are stacked together. And because they're stacked together, I can add them up in a bracket. So do you agree I've got 3M, but what is this initial velocity? This initial velocity is zero times by zero is equal to this dude's mass, which is M, times by the initial velocity. Now, remember, we always have to give direction because of the fact of um, direction positive and negative because they're vectors. So I'm going to choose this as positive and that is negative. So therefore, it's times by 2u, okay, plus 2m, right? And in this case, this is going to be minus u, right? So 3m times 0 is 0 is equal to 2um, and that becomes plus times or minus is minus 2um, which equals 0. So you can see here that we have proven that the momentum before is equal to the momentum after. So we've actually proven it by working this out. Notice also that the momentum is conserved. So the initial velocity of this, the whole thing is 0, right? And, but this mass is half of that mass which means that this velocity is going to be double that velocity. Okay, right. Now let's do some proper examples, okay? So we've got two railway locomotives, A of mass 6,000 kgs and B of mass 5,000 are moving on a straight horizontal track in the same direction at different speeds. Okay, don't worry about it, showing the sketch, I'm going to draw a sketch for you. The two locomotives collide, link together, and move at three meters per second in the original direction immediately after the collision. Now it says calculate the initial velocity of the locomotive B before the collision. Okay, so what do we have? We've got two railway locomotives, A and B. Okay, yeah, we've got A and we've got B. Okay, and we'll call this A and this B. This is a mass of 6,000 kgs and this is a mass of 5,000 kgs and they're moving in the same direction. So they're both going in this direction, let's say. The two of them collide. So this was before the collision. Now they stick together. Okay, they stick together. Okay. And now they link together and they move at three meters per second. They move at three meters per second. Okay. And they want to know, calculate the initial velocity of the locomotive B. Okay. So let's just write this down. So do you agree we've got P before equals P after? And I know my drawings are going around, but this is P before and this is P after. So our P before is going to be the mass of A times by the initial velocity of A plus the mass of B times the initial velocity of B is equal to the mass of A plus B times the final velocity of A plus B because they're stuck together now, right? So do you agree that we have the mass of A? It is 6,000. We have the initial velocity of A, we don't. It says in the same direction as at two different speeds as shown in the sketch. Okay, and what is shown in the sketch is that this is traveling at X and this is traveling at 2X. Okay, that's how it's managing to catch up. So we're going to say that this is X plus this mass is 5,000 times by 2X. Okay, sorry, 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 I don't know why I did that, is equal to the mass of AB all together, mass of A plus B all together, okay, which is going to be 6,000 plus 5,000, and the final velocity that they move off together is 3. So do you agree that all we have to do now is work out what X is, right? So what do we have? We've got 6,000 X plus 5,000 times 2 is going to be 10,000 plus. 
x is equal to 11,000 times by 3. So do you agree that becomes 16,000 x is equal to 33,000? Therefore, x is going to be 33,000 divided by 16,000. And now I need my calculator because I don't actually know what 33 divided by 16 is. So 33 divided by 16 is going to be 2.0625. So we round up to two decimal places. So it's 2.06. So x equals 2,06 meters per second but they didn't ask for x they asked for the initial velocity of locomotive b so we need to multiply that so we got 2 comma 0 6 multiplied by 2 2 times 6 is 12 carry 1 so that becomes just a 1 and that becomes 4. so the initial velocity of locomotive b is 4.12 meters per second Okay, right, let's move on. Now it says another example. So we've got a wooden block of mass two kilograms is moving at a velocity of five meters per second. It collides with a crate of mass nine kilograms resting on a flat horizontal surface as shown in the diagram. So this is stationary, right? So it is resting. So its initial velocity is zero. It then says after the collision, the crate moves off to the right at a velocity of one meter per second. Ignore the effects of friction. So what can we say? We can therefore say it's isolated and therefore we can use the conservation of linear momentum. And it says calculate the magnitude of the friction, I mean magnitude of the velocity of the wooden block immediately after the collision. Okay. So again, I'm just going to change color. I don't like this color so much on this page. P before equals P after. Before, we've got the momentum of the two kilogram plus the momentum of the nine kilogram equals the momentum of the two kilogram plus the momentum of the nine kilogram. Why? Because they don't stick together, okay? Right, so we've got mass of the two kilogram, initial velocity of the two kilogram, plus mass of the nine kilogram, initial velocity of the nine kilogram, is equal to mass of the two kilogram, final velocity of two kilogram, plus mass of the nine kilogram, final velocity of the nine kilogram. Now, I know that seems silly writing down M2 and we could just put numbers in, but remember that I told you this was the money shot. This has definitely needs to be written for you to get all your marks and if you make a mistake but you have correctly substituted into this then you get it right okay so obviously this is two the initial uh, direction because velocity is a vector we always have to choose a direction as being positive so I'm going to choose to the right as being positive so therefore it's two times five plus what this is stationary if it's stationary, its initial velocity is zero. So therefore, I can put a big fat zero there. Equals the mass of two kilograms. And that's what we're trying to find out. We're trying to find its final velocity, Vf2, plus the mass of the nine kilogram. And it's moving in the same direction as the original direction. So therefore, it is still positive and it's one. So 2 times 5 is 10 is equal to 2 VF2 plus 9. So therefore 1 is equal to 2 VF2. Therefore the final velocity of the wooden block is 0, 0,5 meters per second. And it just asks for the magnitude so we do not have to give direction at all. Okay, cool. Now let's talk about elastic and inelastic collisions. And linear momentum and elastic and inelastic collisions go hand in hand because all in every isolated system that there ever is, when it comes to physics, linear momentum is always, always conserved. Always. Doesn't matter if it's a collision or explosion, if it's an isolated system, momentum is conserved. However, Kinetic energy is only conserved if it's an elastic collision. So 
if they ask you to test if something is an elastic collision, we're looking at kinetic energy. That's the bit we need to do. So it says, in an elastic collision, no energy is transferred out of the system due to deformation or friction. No sound or light is emitted. Okay, and please note we do not use the word lost again when describing energy. Remember, guys, we never use the words lost again. We say that light or energy or just anything to do with energy is transformed from one form to another. So in other words, if you hear an accident, okay, you're a car accident. When you hear the car accident, you're hearing the sound energy that's been given off. So what has happened is some of the kinetic energy of the cars has been transformed into deformation energy because it's changed the shape of the cars if they've been in an accident, as well as sound energy because we have heard the accident, and heat energy because if you feel the metal after it's been crunched, it's actually quite hot, and a whole bunch of other energies, but you get the gist. Okay, so in 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 elastic collision, the total kinetic energy of the system is smaller than the collision after collision than before. Yeah, energy is transferred out of the system in the forms of heat, sound, and deformation. And work is needed to change the shape of the object, which is why you have deformation of an object. So let's do an example. Now, before when we were doing momentum, you would write P before equals P after. Now, grade 12, if you write EK before equals EK after, you are wrong because you are trying to prove this. So you can't write that. Okay, yeah, you're assuming that they're equal because that's the law. Yeah, you have to prove whether or not they are equal. Okay, so it says a boy on a skateboard moves to the right at a constant velocity. The joint mass of the ball on the skateboard is 50 kgs, right? He catches a ball of mass 0.4 kgs that is traveling horizontally to the left. Okay, after the boy catches the ball, they together move off still in the direction that he was originally in at 1.49 meters per second. Okay, so he slowed down a little bit. Right, and the first question they say is calculate the magnitude of the velocity V of the boy, boy before he catches the ball. So obviously this is a momentum question because we're, P and we're going to collision. So we're going to have P before and P after. So we've got the P of the boy, boy, plus P of the ball has to equal P of the boy and ball. Okay, why? Because it's an isolated system as far as we're concerned. There's no friction. They haven't told us whether or not there's friction. So as far as we're concerned, I say system. So the mass of the boy the initial velocity of the boy plus the mass of the ball, initial velocity of the ball is equal to mass of the boy and ball, final velocity of boy and ball. Okay, so we again need to decide which direction is positive. So I'm going to choose the direction that the little boy goes in first is to be positive, okay? So the mass of the boy is 50. His final, his initial velocity, we don't know, plus the mass of the ball, which is 0, 0,4, times its initial velocity, which is minus 6, is equal to the mass of the two of them together. So it is going to be 50 plus 4, 0, 0.4, so it's 50, 4, and the final velocity is in the same direction as the original velocity of the boy, so that is going to be 1,49. Right. Therefore, can you see that we're going to write that this is 50 vi, that becomes a plus times a minus is a minus, minus 6 times 0 0.4 is going to be 2,4 is equal to, now that unfortunately I cannot do in my head, so let's get out our calculator. So we've got 50.4 times 1.49 equals 75,096, so 75,1. So it's going to be 75,1. So now I'm going to add that to that, so I'm going to go 50 vi is going to be 5 comma 7 7 
Therefore, VI is going to be 77 comma 5 all over 50, which equals 1 point something, obviously. So it's going to be 77.5 divided by 50 equals 1 comma 5 5 equals 1,55 meters per second in which direction it would be to the right to the right okay so calculate the magnitude oh it would just have been 1.55 so that's 1,55 we've just proven it okay now it says prove with the necessary calculations that this is an inelastic collision. So in order to do that, we need to work out our EK before, and then we need to work out our EK after and see if they're equal. Okay, so I'm going to erase some of this writing so that we can have a look-see at what we've got. We've got. Actually, you know what? 1.55. Right, so we know that this velocity is 1 comma 5, 5. Right, so let's do this. We've got EK before. So that is equal to the EK of the boy plus EK of the ball. And again, remember, we have to decide on a direction as positive. And again, I'm just going to make it to the right as positive. And the equation of kinetic energy is a half mv squared of the boy plus a half mv squared of the ball. Okay. So what have we got? We've got a half times the mass of the boy of 50 plus I mean, multiplied by its velocity of 1 comma 5, 5, all squared, plus a half times the mass of the ball of 0 comma 4, times by its velocity of minus 6, but it's all squared. So let's pop that into our calculators. So we've got 0.5 times 50 times 1.55 squared squared plus 0.5 times 0.4 and then because this is a negative I'm going to go bracket minus 6 close 6 close bracket squared equals and it becomes this horrible number, which is 67.26. So that is equal to 67,26 joules. Right, now we need to work out the kinetic energy afterwards, EK afterwards, which is the kinetic energy of the boy and the ball together. So that's 50, 4 times by a half times by its final velocity of 1, 4, 9 all squared. So let's get out our calculators and move it over. So do you agree that becomes 0, 5 times 50.4 hmm, 50.4 times 1.49 squared. Oh, sorry. 4 9 squared equals, and that's 55.95, so that equals 55,95 joules. So therefore we can say that it's pretty obvious that this is not an elastic collision because kinetic energy has not been conserved, they're not the same. Right, grade 12, that's it for today. Please join me tomorrow as I continue to talk about momentum and um, conservation of momentum and conservation of kinetic energy. Have a great day.